Hello, good evening. Namaste, everybody. Jai Guru to all. I'm just back in time for the class after such a beautiful pilgrimage. Uh, it was so heart touching, all those places that we visited. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm just back from, from a pilgrimage of the Buddha circuit, means the place where Buddha was born, that is in Lumbini, Nepal, and the place where he left his body, that is in Kushinagar, Uttar Pradesh. And I also visit, I visited Ayodhya and Gorakhpur uh, to the house where Master was born. And uh, all of these places have wonderful vibrations. And because of uh, the historical importance as well. Once you go to these places, it appears as if you are traveling in time as well as in, in distance. Because when you talk about the Buddha uh, and the, the remains of the Ashoka Empire, so we found remains from th three century BC, and yet the, uh, the silence of the uh, power of the Buddha is still there. It's very, very tangible and palpable. So it was very, very beautiful. And it would be a good idea to visit these places whenever any of you does get the time. And if God willing, uh, sometime in the future, if we organize a small pilgrimage to these places, then anyway, you guys can uh, join us. But even if a big group pilgrimage is not organized, but you get your time individually to go to these places, please make sure that you do visit these places. Instead of going to tourist spots, these places are of very high consciousness, very high energy. They take you within and they help in your inner pilgrimage. So as master said that environment is stronger than willpower. So when we go to these places where devotees over thousands of years have offered their devotion, have tried to feel their oneness with God, then you too can attune yourself to that frequency and it becomes easier to settle your restless thoughts down. It becomes easier to tune into the life of great ones. So pilgrimages are always a good idea. Definitely the inner pilgrimage is most important, but the outer helps the inner. So with that thought, my dear friends, let's begin today's class on Christ. Let us start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lehri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji, Beloved Gurudev Paramhansa Yogananda Ji, Friend and Guide Swami Kriyananda Ji, Saints and Sages of all religions, humbly we bow at thy feet. O living Christ, in the body of Jesus and in all of us, Manifest thy tangible presence in the ascents of thy glory, in the strength of thy power, and in the light of thy perfect wisdom. Om, peace, amen. Let us invoke the presence of the gurus by singing the hymn to Brahma.
let's try and feel the presence of the divine within ourselves. We shall sing the chant written and composed by Rabindranath Tagore and translated into English by Yogananda Ji. Who is in my temple? All the doors do open themselves, all the lights do light themselves. Take a few moments of silence, sitting upright with a straight spine, an upturned gaze, a smile in the heart, a smile on the face, complete relaxation within. Let us be in this present moment with full awareness so that we may receive the blessings by hearing the story of Jesus the Christ. Let us first hear a few thoughts on awareness by Swami Kriyananda. 
Awareness deepens the more it is centered in itself. But the farther a person's interest extend outside himself, the thinner the supply line of his awareness becomes. If a person's consciousness is centered outwardly in things, it takes on those qualities which it attributes to those things. Jewelers, for instance, often have bright eyes. People with no sense of higher values have dead eyes. Man needs to learn to change his focus from what he is aware of to what he is aware with. He needs to become more aware at the source of his awareness, at his deeper center in God. Through this awareness, his enjoyment even of the surrounding world becomes intensified a thousandfold. Let us do the following affirmation. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and faith. For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and faith. For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and faith. For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. Let us mentally follow this prayer. Infuse me from my deepest center with thy joy. Make me aware of thee, my divine beloved, in all that I behold. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So we come back to our study of Christ. <clears throat> In the last class, we talked about the infancy gospels about Christ, about the miracles that were performed when uh, Jesus was a small child and uh, uh, how uh, his life was, he was molding his life according to the will of the heavenly father. And that how people who were around him still did not understand the import of his presence could not recognize that the Messiah was in that body. And uh, as we were ending the last class, we talked about how uh, I, for the festival of Passover, when Joseph, Mary and uh, Jesus had gone to the, to the temple in Jerusalem. And when they were returning, uh, Jesus was left behind in the temple. He did so for a purpose. And then when Joseph and Mary came back on the second or third day to collect him, they were reprimanding him about why he was left behind. And uh, he just calmly told them, didn't you know that I would be doing the business of my father and that my father meant his heavenly father and not the earthly father. Mary and Joseph both had this knowledge that this child was divine. But as this is also a human drama, which is superimposed on divine realities, they were also the physical father and mother of the child Jesus. Therefore, the attachment, therefore, the possessiveness, and therefore, you know, trying to, to protect the child. But deep in their hearts, they knew that this was a divine child, and he had to go about doing the business of the heavenly father. On this note, Master is very, he gives a specific guidance, and I would like to read that out. Master says that the ordinary man thinks of the world, his family, his work, as his, and his business. That is the most important business that he has. That's what the normal person, the average human thinks. But the spiritual man knows that duties to parents, to children, family ties, the business world and all else are to be carried out as service to God. Everyone should help to maintain the well-being of the world by a universal consciousness of love and service, 
rather than as a selfish man whose actions are compelled and actuated by instinctive blood ties and greed. So uh, in the Mahabharata, in one of the sections, it is mentioned that uh, when there is a higher duty, then the lesser duty ceases to be. So there are many times when our duties are in conflict, there are multiple things to be done. And then uh, we do not sometimes know which one we should do first, which should be a priority and which, which ones should we leave out. So there is guidance in the Shastras accord for this. And they say that when there is a higher duty and the higher duty definitely means an unselfish duty, a duty which involves more harmony and peace and expansiveness towards others, a duty which is of course for God and for higher purpose, that would be definitely the more important duty as compared to a duty which I think is, is for me, my work, my job, my money, my family. So that would be a lesser duty in, in the ladder of, you know, uh, the importance of duties. So the, in the Mahabharata, it is clearly said that whenever there is a higher duty, and then the lower duty should not be in, in conflict. In fact, the lower duty ceases to be important. So one should not feel guilty if one is serving the guru, if one is busy serving God, then one should not feel guilty or ashamed that I'm not able to fulfill all my you know, daily chores that I wanted to do. And in fact, you will have to miss those to create time and energy for yourself so that you are available uh, to have your appointment with God so that you are available to do your higher duties. So always remember that and don't feel guilty if you have to leave some things that you earlier in your earlier material life you thought were important. But when your spiritual life dawns upon you, you know that meditation is and contact with God is of the highest importance. That service to the guru, service to others is more important than I, me and mine. So once you have realized that and you know this is the right direction, then just forget about or you can maybe just push aside the, the little chores of everyday life which are not going to lead us anywhere. They do not give us lasting fulfillment. And only it is the contact, personal, tangible contact with God on a daily basis that gives us a sense of fulfillment, that gives us that completeness, uh, which nothing else can give. And that's why the Gita claims that once you have God, it is, it is a gain uh, in front of which no gain is greater. So we want, all of us, we want to have that gain having which nothing else stands greater. And that gain is, of course, uh, the oneness, the communion with God, with Krishna or with Christ or whoever we believe in. Another uh, advice that Master gives here is he says that uh, uh, people should encourage their children to go towards God from an early age. So uh, I remember that when I was a child, you know, there was this, uh, the family atmosphere was such that we would sometimes sing bhajans in the night and then we would go to sleep. We would have regular prayers on Tuesdays for Hanumanji or we would go to have special prayers on Sunday for some, in some occasions we would we used to have fire ceremony. So there was this atmosphere. But these days, uh, everybody has become more materialistic and, you know, we want our children to just compete in schools and in, in tuition classes, in sports, in music. We want them to join all sorts of classes, but uh, we don't even teach them sometimes to bow in front of the uh, temple that we have created in our house. We have not created that culture. So if we do not introduce our children to God, then uh, it is going to be more difficult for them. See, whenever God is going to touch them, it's going to happen for them. But if we can, we, as parents, we can mediate that process. We can make it easy for them. If in their childhood, the child has learned that when the time is difficult, you need to surrender to God. If the child has watched that the parent has prayed to God in difficult times, has surrendered to God in difficult times, and yet has done the duty that was required, the child knows when the child grows or becomes an adult and it has to live on its own, which it sometimes has to eventually, it knows where to go in case of trouble. So he doesn't, the child does not feel alone. He knows that there is a God and he knows that he can always call upon that God who's available to each one of us. So the, for the child, God doesn't become a far off reality. It, the parents should ensure that the child should know that God is, is by their side, that God is their true friend, and he's always available. So this is something that parents can help to inculcate. And this is something that master has said that parents should try and do. 
Okay, so we move forward in the story of Christ and we come to a very important juncture. Uh, in the New Testament, in all the Western Bibles that are available, the last documentation of the uh, childhood of Jesus is at the age of 12 in the Temple of Jerusalem when he is speaking to all those the wise men and the doctors and all the learned people of Jerusalem. And after that, what the scripture just says is, um, says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So this is a general statement. Uh, and then the scripture resumes after 18 years when Jesus is to be baptized by John the Baptist. So yes, it is uh, very, very intriguing is that um, the contemporaries of Jesus or the disciples of Jesus, the apostles later, they had no idea of where he was. Or it's, it's kind of difficult to digest. And uh, we are not the only ones for whom it is difficult to digest. There are people who have actually written about the missing years of Jesus. And we'll just talk about it. Uh, Paramanth Yogananda ji has also mentioned about it. Okay. So uh, uh, Master says, remarkable accounts exist not in the land of Jesus's birth, but farther east where he spent most of his unaccounted years, hidden away in a Tibetan monastery, priceless records lie. They speak of a Saint Isa from Israel in whom was manifest the soul of the universe, who from the age of 14 to 28 was in India and regions of the Himalayas among saints, monks, and pundits, who preached his message throughout that area and then returned to teach in his native land where he was treated vilely, condemned, and put to death. Okay, so uh, all of this is given in a Tibetan monastery. So master mentions a monastery by the name of Himis, and it is just outside of Leh. Whoever has visited the region of Leh Ladakh would have heard of a Himis monastery. I've also been there, but it is only later that I read this and I, and I was trying to correlate the, oh my God, I'd gone there and I, <laughs> I missed the place where Jesus account was present. So you know, we are humans like that only. So, so there's this monastery. And it is said that some Tibetan original manuscripts in a different language are present in that monastery. So in 1880s, there was this Russian explorer uh, by the name of Nicholas Notovich. So he uh, was also intrigued about the missing years of Jesus and he heard about such accounts. So he traveled all the way into Nepal, Tibet and in Northern India. And he reached this monastery and he requested the monks there to uh, share the, the manuscripts with him. But they refused completely because they knew that this was something very sacred. They did not want it to come out in the public. And so he was refused. So after many day, days of you know, uh, poking them, he was uh, told to go. And on his way back in the Himalayas, he met with an accident, which was almost fatal, but he survived and his, he broke a leg. And the people who kind of um, helped him out of, he told them to take him back to Himis Monastery. So in an injured state of affairs, he went back to Himis Monastery. And this time, since they, the Buddhist monks are supposed to be full of compassion and care. So he took, kind of took advantage of the situation and uh, he, he had to stay there for many days. And he insisted this time that he must be shared, the records of uh, Isa must be shared with him. And so it did happen that on this occasion, uh, the, the records were opened up and then he also involved a translator and he uh, eventually he wrote a book and that book was, I think, called The Missing Years of Jesus. And after this, of course, when he went back to America and Europe, uh, nobody wanted to, the Roman Catholic Church did not want to encourage such a thing. But uh, the book exists, and if you want, you can read it. And in fact, there have been many more people who have written about these manuscripts later. In fact, there was in the 1920s, uh, uh, one of the Swamis from Ramakrishna Mission, I think Swami Abhidananda, uh, he went into the monasteries and he was also able to get in touch with those manuscripts. And now multiple books have been written about the presence of Isa, uh, the saint from Israel who had these powers and who, who also gained knowledge through his company, uh, accompaniment of the Buddhists and of the monks and of his meditation and so on. Uh, besides that, Master mentions that 
Jesus also visited Jagannath Puri. So, uh, and it is said that um, he, uh, he, he had the knowledge, he also read the Vedas, he read those uh, the Indian scriptures, and, uh, but he, he would have fights with the pundits there because we are talking of the time of Jesus means the depth of the Kali Yoga, the darkest of the ages that was present. And everybody was, the, the true knowledge of the Brahmins were, was clouded by the material world. And there was this intense caste system and there was too much shrouded in you know, rituals and so on. That the essence of religion was somewhere you know, getting lost. So, uh, so J Jesus would have confrontation with the pundits and eventually after staying there for many years, he moved out uh, from there and also because he wanted to follow the monotheistic religion and he uh, joined the Buddhists in, in Kashmir and Tibet where he spent a lot of time. Now here an important thing to know is that although Hinduism appears to be a polytheistic religion on the outset, on the superficial side, it appears that yes, there is Ganesha, there is Masaraswati or Madurga, or there is Krishna, there is uh, Shiva, and there is so, and in that time, there were so many sects like the Vaishnavites, the Shaivites, the, you know, the Shakti followers. So it was a lot divided at that time. But the truth is that uh, no one like the Indian scriptures explains the monotheistic truth behind all these forms. So it, Hinduism clearly talks about the, uh, the non-dual, the formless, the one Brahman means uh, the Nirgun Brahman from which comes everything in the universe, including the gods with forms, including humans, including all of creation. So actually Hinduism is a purely monotheistic religion but it has created bridges in the forms of gods and goddesses which are most so that people can relate to them more which have similar to human forms but a little more power than the human so it kind of acts as a bridge uh, you know from it's easier to go from form to the formless it is easier to go from sound first and then into silence from in multitude to oneness so these are one must fully understand that you know, all religions eventually talk about the one same truth that God is one, and we all must realize that. In fact, um, very I'll share one very interesting story. I had gone; it was the Navratra time, and and gone to a, a shop, and the shop belonged to a Sikh, and uh, he had displayed all the Navratra items as well. And at that time, I think that that particular year, I had returned from the, my visit to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So I had, from there, I had bought a small cross and I was wearing a small cross in my, uh, on my neck. And I was asking the Sikh about the Navratra food. So he was looking at my face and he was looking at my cross. He says, you are a Christian and you're looking for Navratra food. I said, then what? <laughs> so I said, what, what is the point of any religion? In whatever religion I may be born, if I do not understand that there is only one God, then what is the point of it all? <laughs> and yes, he, then he smiled and he also understood because in Sikhism, this is the concept, Ik Omkar, they also say God is one. And how the oneness of God is realized? By the grace of a true Guru, Ik Omkar Sadgur Prasad. So every religion is purely monotheist actually. They believe in one God, only the expressions are many. So here again, uh, so coming back to our story, so Jesus moved from Jagannath Puri to monasteries in, in northern Kashmir, Tibet, and he stayed there for a long time, till about 28 years or so. And initially, how the question comes, how did he come from Israel? He was such a small child. How did he come to this area? So it is said that the famous Chinese Silk Route existed at that time. And there were traders and businessmen, they would come uh, and travel long distances. So this child who was not interested in any household uh, you know, life, which was in, in Jerusalem at that time, in that area, when the children attained puberty, let's say between 13 and 16, they would be married. So of course, he did not want to get that into that. And that was not his mission. So with this group of businessmen and traders, he came into this land. And after the age of 28, he started to uh, walk back the same route through Mesopotamia, through Egypt and all of that, those areas. And it is said that he did spread his teachings there, but like every place, 
he was famous with the uh, populace, with the general population, but he was the, the priest, the local priest, the pundits, they would, he would always be cross with all of them because he would talk about the essence of that oneness and the love of God, the mercy of God. And the priest would talk about the superficial rituals and you should do this and you should not do that and all of that. And of course, uh, priesthood uh, in that age meant a lot of power. So eventually it's all a game of uh, I, me and mine. And Jesus knew that we should be much above that. So anyway, that conflict happened till he reached back uh, to his own land and there he started preaching and we will move on in the story as to know then what happened next okay just give me a moment as I catch up with my notes okay so a few words from master very important uh, he says in order to understand the doctrine of Jesus Christ, it is necessary to combine organizational efficiency and social welfare philanthropy with personal verification of Christ's teaching by metaphysical study and actual contact with God. So what is he saying here? Here he's saying that um, in the East, what was more prominent was an inner contact with God. But in the West, what was more uh, common was a very well-organized religion. You know, the, the, the church is a very well-organized thing. They have beautiful churches. What master said that both are important. The hive is important and the honey of devotion and the honey of God contact, both are important. So if we were to really progress spiritually, and if you would want to include uh, you know, the, 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 all the people in our spiritual growth, then we need both. We need a good organizational setup like they have in the West, and we need a personal contact, a personal communion with God, which can be uh, have done by the process of meditation. And that's why the gurus tell us how to meditate, how to go within, and how to find the divine, which is present everywhere, but it is most beautifully expressed in every human heart. So we have to go inside, but then we need the hive as well as the honey. Okay, so then master goes on to say, truth in and of itself is the ultimate religion. Though truth can be expressed in different ways by sectarian sins, it can never be exhausted by them. It has infinite manifestations and ramifications, but one consummation that is direct experience of God. Jesus the Christ is an excellent model for both East and West to follow. God's stamp, son of God, is hidden in every soul. Jesus affirmed the scriptures, ye are gods. So we must remember this very important statement. We have heard it many times that God is within us. But when we look, Master said, when you look at your face in the mirror, do you say, where is the God? You think that God is somewhere else? It's be he's beyond the clouds somewhere. Maybe he lives not in India, in some other country. So we are basically imagining that one day we will find him. That he is, we have to go somewhere actually to find him. And then in, we also think that we will find him in some future point in time. So basically, this is all a delusion where we think that in some future point we'll find and some other place we will find him. The truth is, God is always right here and right now. Whether we understand it or not is a different story. Whether we know it or not is a different story. So this is the truth. So eventually, if God, God has made us, we are made in that God's substance. So everything is God's substance and we are a part of that God's substance. That means in the tr true sense, we are never separate from God. God is always here and now and we can always connect to him. And the way to connect to him is to go inwards. So every time you have this thought comes to you that, oh, when am I going to find God? Just pause. Tell yourself, this is a delusional thought. God has made me. God is in me. God is protecting me. God is loving me. God is my best friend right now, right here. 
and then just close the mental door to all the other thoughts that try to tell you otherwise. Once you are convinced of this truth that God is with you, and how do you get convinced of this truth? Sometimes you do feel, hey, but when time is bad, we say, I don't know where it is, where it is. So how do we embrace this truth in our own? How do we embrace this truth? Yes, God is in me. The only way is to feel his tangible presence in meditation. So once you do your meditation techniques and you find that over the uh, weeks, months and years, the thoughts in your meditation start to settle down and you start to feel um, the presence. And the presence can be felt in, in the way of power or love or joy or complete stillness and peace. So once you have reached that point, you know that there is something larger than me and my thoughts. And that is God's presence within me. So that when you have to touch that reality in your meditation, once you start touching that reality in meditation, even for a fraction of a second, if you do that for in a day or maybe once in a few days, you will know the truth that God is indeed right now, right here, and he indeed is in you. So therefore, meditation is so important, is the airplane route. And it will help you to know that ye are gods, as Jesus said. Okay. So we move on to the next discourse. And we will do only a little of it, which is relevant for today's class. And we may finish the class a little earlier than usual, but uh, we'll just go with the flow of the story. Because now, interesting, now the uh, New Testament comes back to, now let's visualize that Jesus has returned back to his own land in Israel. And uh, uh, now he's going to, the, the main events of his life start to unfold and the entire drama will unfold. And with each and every uh, teaching later on, he will tell a story and then he will explain how it is relevant to our life. Okay, so we come to the baptism of Jesus. And first I will read out what the, the words of the gospel. They are slightly, you know, they, they feel ancient, but let's just first listen to them and then we will go into the explanation. Okay, so the gospel says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized by him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, so we'll first try and understand what this means. So it is, we talked about the birth of John the Baptist, how it was just a few months uh, before the birth of Jesus Christ. And then it is said that in his childhood, John the Baptist had left his, uh, his parents, his family and his village, and he would go and live in the forest. In the forest, he actually subsisted only upon on honey and the fruit of a tree, which is called the locust tree. So many uh, people have this confusion when they hear that he would survive on locusts and honey, because in common knowledge, locust is an insect that uh, we have read in childhood. So when, when they talk of it in scripture, is loca there's a tree called locust and was is present in that area and he would eat the fruit of that tree and some honey. So that was his only food. And he would be in the wilderness, he would wear something of leather around his loins and that's it. Okay. So, and it is said that the birth of John the Baptist was also prophesied by the, uh, in the you know, previous prophecies by the um, various prophets that came before Jesus and uh, John the Baptist. And uh, slowly, as he came in from the wilderness, when John the Baptist came into town, he started to call upon people. He uh, started to ask them to repent for their sins. So uh, what does it mean to repent for your sins? So it's easy for each one of us to start counting 
the sins of others or the other the, the bad that the others do but we kind of just fail to look inside of us and this clearly reminds me of the simple doha by kabir da kabir das ji bura jo dekhan main chala bura na milya koi jo dil dekha apna mujhse bura na koi so this is what john the baptist called each individual to do to introspect to look within to realize that we do make as humans we have made mistakes but that the lord is a merciful lord that if we just say that okay lord i am sorry in my little understanding i may not have intentionally or unintentionally made mistakes i may have made mistakes but i come to your door i surrender to you in love in faith in prayer in devotion and then if you if you just open up your heart the the acknowledgement that i may be wrong means you are surpassing the ego the ego says i am right and all of you are wrong my opinion my thought is the only right thing available everybody else is wrong so the moment you say that i may be wrong that means your head goes down means the medulla relaxes and master said this is the center of the ego you kind of bow down to the lord and it is at that point where god can actually help you and cleanse you from within so it's important for everyone to introspect and to be clean in front of the lord clean means uh, if the parent knows that the child has done wrong and the child also realizes and says sorry sorry mama or sorry papa the parent immediately you know it's it forgives immediately so similarly if we just say to god that i'm sorry uh, even if i don't realize but you i know you are merciful and i bow before you then our sins are forgiven and that is the truth and there's a there's a beautiful uh, you know statement in the guru granth sahib matching to this he says the, the guru nanak dev says if uh, if i was not a sinner how would you be called a redeemer so this is he saying this to the lord you know this you are called a redeemer because i have sinned because i am a sister, i am this little child of yours and i am prone to as a human i am prone to make mistakes but then you are the savior that you you are the merciful lord you are the most compassionate and you will call the be called the most compassionate because you will forgive my sins so this is like a loving relationship with god you don't have to just be like a beggar in front of god and says oh i have made mistake oh my god i am such a sinner master said never do that don't say you are a sinner i we may have made mistakes but i am a pure soul i am a child of god so start from that point and if i am a child of god and I, if i love god with all my heart mind strength and soul then god has no choice actually but to forgive me but to embrace me and, and to uplift me so give god no choice no room to leave you out so this is up to the child master said the child should cry so much that the mother has to come and lift the child up so the divine mother the heavenly father krishna or jesus christ if you just keep calling upon them then they have to listen to you why because we are an inseparable part of their consciousness we are also that light so there is even god has no choice when a devotee lovingly calls upon him so we must remember that we are no beggars we are children of the lord and with with that you know confidence in ourselves we can ask for what we want and it will be given to us okay so uh, again background of john he is calling people to repentance he is paving the way for the for christ to come and we read further in the gospel but when he saw many of the pharisees and the sadducees then came to his baptism he said unto them o generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourself we have abraham our, as our father for i say unto you that god is able of these stones to raise up children unto abraham and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire okay so let's kind of solve this mystery of uh, linguistic jargon and what it means is 
in the story, what happened was when John the Baptist started uh, baptizing people in River Jordan. Uh, and that time it was uh, the custom, which is even now that, you know, the, the people would uh, sprinkle of water or they would be immersed in the water. And in the name of the Lord, uh, the person would be baptized. So John the Baptist was doing this. So some Pharisees and Sadducees. So these are classes of priests that existed at that time. So some of them were, came to John the Baptist, some may be sincere, some would have been just to test as to what John the Baptist is doing. And John the Baptist clearly saw that uh, they are just testing him. And that's why he said, oh, generation of vipers, vipers mean the snake viper he's talking about. And he said to them that you proudly say that you are children of Abraham. In all the scriptures of the Old Testament, uh, all the uh, Abrahamic religions, the people are proud that they are children of Abraham. But then just being the children of Abraham it does not redeem every soul. Okay, So each soul has to go back to God. So just by saying that I am a child of Abraham does not redeem you. So this is what John the Baptist is saying, that what do you think God can raise children of Abraham from these stones which are lying around you? And you are just saying that I am the child of Abraham. So this is no big deal. That's what he's trying to tell them. And then he says, the ax will be laid uh, to the root of that tree, which produces bad fruit. So uh, what he's saying again is matching the words of, of Krishna that, you know, wherever there is unrighteousness, there will be, you know, uh, that person or that community that goes down. And when there is righteousness, when there is dharma, there is victory. So this is what John the Baptist is saying in uh, that time in that particular language. Okay. Then he goes on to tell them, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Okay, so um, again, he is being very, very strict with everybody. And he's saying that you think I am the prophet or the Messiah, but you don't know the one who is mightier than me, the one who is going to follow me. And he's mentioning, he's talking about Jesus the Christ and that how I am baptizing with water, but he will baptize you with Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. And in, in, according to Indian scriptures, what this matches is with the Om vibration. So if uh, any of you, are, if you are disciples of Paramahansa Yogananda, gone through the discipleship ceremony, you would know that we have been, in a sense, baptized in Om, in that Holy Ghost vibration. We have been baptized through the Guru. So similarly, uh, that's what John the Baptist said that he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And it is said that when a master accepts you as his disciple, he, there is his mantle, his un, invisible spiritual mantle comes to rest upon the disciple. So the master is always trying to protect the disciple. Now it is up to the disciple to make use of this connection. So if the disciple is sincere and in attunement to what the guru is saying, then he will derive the maximum magnetism and grace from the guru. But if the disciple keeps doubting that, oh, I don't even know if he's around, if he even knows my problems, if he truly understands me or not, he's helping others, but he may not help. So these are long questions that keep coming to you. And then you are not regular with your practices. So then you will not be in attunement to the channel that he has opened within your own heart. So it's important that we attune ourselves to the light, the ray of light that has been sent from God through the masters. Jesus Christ is also on our altar. He is one of the, our line of gurus. And of course, Paramahansa Yogananda is there. Babaji is there. Lehri Mahash, Swami Sri Yukteswar. We are blessed to have uh, great divine incarnations and who are, who are with us. But it is to, uh, up to us to tune ourselves into their presence. You may think it is just a picture on the wall, but think again. Feel it in your heart and you will know it's not just a picture on the wall. It is a living presence and it is your own love and devotion that you offer to that picture or to a murti that makes it all the more alive. And you will find that 
if you keep connecting to a picture in your house of the guru or of your ishta you will find that the picture can give you answers in difficult times that it has the living presence always and in difficult times when you close your eyes you can see that picture inside of you because every day you have made it a practice to kind of bow in front of that to look into the eyes of that deity so it being becomes alive so it is up to us to connect with god and the gurus okay uh, <clears throat> Master says, a holy man of desert solitudes, subsisting on wild honey and the fruit of locust trees, John engaged himself in the mysteries and meditations of an anchorite, awaiting Jesus to proclaim himself ready to begin his ministry. When John uh, made himself known in the environs of Judea, crowds followed him as a saint and prophet. His renown made it possible for him to fulfill worthily, worthily his part in Jesus's destiny, a pattern set in their previous relationship as Elijah and Elisha. Okay, so um, the last thought for today is uh, that Master says that God uh, consciously screens our past lives from all of us. So it is definitely, if I were to ask you this question, would you prefer to remember all your past life, uh, lives right now? Or would you prefer to forget them? So uh, to as many people have asked this question, everybody says we want to forget it. <laughs> so that's God knows. God knows we cannot handle so many thoughts, so many, when we cannot handle one lifetime, how are we going to handle the complex relationships, the feelings, the thoughts, the conflicts, and it is said that same souls keep coming in different relationships. So if in one incarnation, somebody was your brother, in past incarnation, uh, was your child. So it will get all, it is going to all get complicated. So God is very wise and he therefore screens that. Of course, the yogis who are one with the universe can know all those incarnations. But then they are at that vantage point where they are already detached from everybody. So they are, since they are not attached to anybody, they impartially can see all their past incarnations and so on. But for the general person, uh, it is uh, helpful that God has kind of washed away the superficial memories of the past. And each time uh, we are given a new slate with new experiences. So not only is the slate uh, cleaned, but there is a continuous progress also. So for example, Master says, if there's a particular lesson that you have learned in one lifetime and you have learned it well, then the similar test will not be given to you in the next lifetime. So yes, you do carry some, some scars from the past, but it is slowly spiritual evolution keeps happening with every lifetime. But uh, according to the Bhagavad Gita explanations given by Master, he said, even if you were to live a righteous life, a fully righteous life, uh, without any technique of meditation, then even then it will take you thousands to millions of years of many births and deaths to get yourself free. And therefore, he has come with the airplane route to God. And definitely, yes, Kriya Yoga is a magical technique that helps, not magical, I would say scientific technique of yoga that helps us to feel, go into that silence, that to go towards the tangible presence of God within us. So, uh, so thank God for screening the various lifetimes and thank God for sending the guru with the technique which is capable of freeing us from the shackles of karma, of shackles of delusion in which we feel that I, me, mine, and that's the most important thing. So with the grace of God, with the grace of guru and with the teachings of these scriptures, these stories like this are like the Puranas, you know, which help by example, uh, to see as to what we should be doing, which is the direction we should be taking. And uh, when we hear this, uh, the, the Hindu Shastra says that when you listen to such stories, then your chitta is purified. A chitta is purified, meaning uh, when if there are many, too many ripples on the surface of the lake, you cannot see the bottom. But a pure chitta is like a still lake. And once you, when, in, in, when you're engrossed in listening to stories of avatars, then the other thoughts tend to fall away. The, uh, the ripples on the surface of the mind, they can tend to become silent, relatively silent. And it is easier to go into the depth of the soul in such a state of consciousness. So yes, these stories are really, really beneficial. 
and so is the presence of guru and god in our life so with that thought my dear friends let's just share the power of these teachings of god's blessings of his love with all souls everywhere let us pray together divine mother beloved lord jesus thou art omnipresent thou art in all thy children manifest thy healing power in all bodies all minds and all souls let's rub our hands together let's send vibrations of healing and love to all souls everywhere Divine Mother, beloved Lord Jesus, may Thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion, and may we be able to awaken Thy love in all hearts. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.